morning once again and welcome. Welcome to worship here at Sharon Seventh-day Adventist Church. Glad to have you with us here once again on this Sabbath morning. And we just pray that you've had a week that has been as stress-free as possible, a week that allows you to come. And as I do, we just crawl to the Sabbath, wishing you a blessed and happy Sabbath. I'm Pastor Michael Dyson from the Sharon Seventh-day Adventist Church here in Baltimore. And I welcome you on this very special weekend. It's always a wonderful opportunity to come together as fellow believers and uplift the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. 2020 has been a challenging year for us, and we've used every medium that we can uh, to connect with each other. Uh, our teleconference number is on the screen where you can call in and be a part of the service today. Uh, even after the morning service, we have our afternoon services, and that number is also one we use quite frequently, 563-999-2090, and then the code of 435-402, and hit the pound sign, and you can come right in and be a part of it. Those who have already been on the line this morning uh, know that each Sabbath morning, we start out here uh, using our different modes of Facebook, and uh, we use YouTube, but we use that line as we start our prayer in the morning here, uh, as we have our Sabbath school here, and we just thank the Lord for you, that you're able to join with us. 2020 has been a challenging year, but 2020 is allowing us to know that we want to be ready for Jesus. How about you? We want to do everything that we can and just surrender everything else so that he can get us to the kingdom. And I remind you that we start out with prayer here on Sabbath mornings at 845, using the number I gave you earlier. You can call in, leave your prayer requests. You can call in and just pray uh, with those who are on the line. Our prayer team, our prayer warriors uh, do a wonderful job. And then uh, at 915 every week is our Sabbath school on the same line. Uh, and we're finishing up on our quarter. Uh, they've been studying and using a book dealing with how to interpret scripture. And what they found out, what we find out is that the Bible interprets itself. Uh, but it's been a great study. And we're going to be leaving that here very shortly for a new quarter and a new book. And we're looking forward to it, teaching us how to witness to others, especially at this time. Our prayer initiative goes every day, Monday through Friday at 12 noon. And uh, using the line that I've given you, 563 999 2090 and the code that I've given you, you can come right in and we pray each day. We take prayer requests, praise reports, and just check in with one another. Uh, it's an awesome time to stay connected, even with a pandemic that's continuing to ravage. Uh, we're still moving forward together and still staying connected. There's a special program today, and I mentioned it last week, and it's actually today. At 3 p.m., the leaders of our conference, the Allegheny East Conference, our administrative leaders are going to be discussing the turbulent times in which we are living in. You can tune in. You can go right to the website of visitaec.org. Visitaec.org at 3 p.m. And our president, Elder Henry Fordham, our administrative uh, leader there, Elder Palmer, and our vice president for finance, uh, Elder Lawrence Martin. And they're going to be talking uh, in a discussion format, and I'm sure they'd love to have you come alongside and join in with that discussion. And then at 4 p.m., on the same line, every week we have it right here at Sharon, is our spiritual growth. And spiritual growth is a time, a free-for-all, to just go over those questions you may have in detail, study the Bible, and as you're talking with others, you'll be amazed at the information that you have and that you can share and what you'll be able to pick up when you dial into that line. That's at 4 p.m. today and each Sabbath right here at Sharon. I'm so happy that we are going forward with our camp meeting this year. In fact, next week on the 26th begins our virtual camp meeting. And it is God, it is your vision, but God's provision is the theme of it. And they've got some wonderful presenters this year that are going to do a great job. We've got an ordination service with two uh, pastors being ordained. It's going to be awesome, and you want to be a part of that. Visit AEC.org, and we're going to be showing that here on our site as well. So when you tune in on those Sabbaths, we're going to be at camp meeting, and camp meeting will be the messages on those Sabbaths so you can be here. We just say happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there, all of my colleagues and being fathers, and if you're like me, 
being a father most of the time was on the job training but I'm so proud to be a dad and I just say happy Father's Day to you too uh, as you celebrate this day and as we come together to celebrate this Sabbath happy Sabbath to you everybody let's worship him today in spirit and in truth God bless you the world needs to know about this we set our work aside leave our cares behind we leave our cares behind on this day our Sabbath rest it's the holy day a memorial to creation on this your holy day we come sing the praises of our Lord and our Savior in our time together. Sabbath rest is a blessed rest, and it is a wonderful opportunity that the Lord has given us that we can rest in Him. Now, we come today to worship Him. We come today to worship Him in spirit, and we come to worship Him in truth right here at Sharon. I hope you have your Bibles. We do every week that we come together. Uh, our affirmation of faith is found in John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Powerful verses. John chapter 3, verse 16 says in my Bible, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And then John 3, 17 says, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And then there is our charge. We understand that it is a gift that God has given us in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. In Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9, and my Bible says this, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, and not of works lest any man should boast. Oh, what a powerful gift he's given us. And we've even seen in those scriptures that God understands being a father. He's given us his son. And I love what the word says, that his son did not come to condemn us. Uh, Jesus is not out to condemn you. Jesus is on a mission to save us. Oh, what a wonderful, blessed mission that is. And for those today who are seeking the salvation, seeking the hope of this God, he calls you, he beckons to you to come. And I want to come alongside you this morning as we do each Sabbath. And I want to just pray with you. It's prayer time. I just want to pray the prayer of thanksgiving. Thanking the Lord for bringing us through another week. Thanking him for whatever belies us. I come today as we pray even for those who are today grieving. Even within our church, uh, we lift up family members. Sister Agnes, we're with you this morning on the loss of your brother. We've been praying for him on the prayer line. Uh, God knows best, and God takes those tears that we have and shed, and he captures them. He knows us. Let's go to him in prayer this morning. Father in heaven, what a great God you are. Father, we just thank you for loving us and being with us and abiding with us. Uh, Lord, we thank you for forgiving our sins, just blessing us. Those things that you do, uh, not because of us, but in spite of us and where we are. 
And so today, Lord, we lift before you my dear sister Agnes, her family, and Lord, so many others who are grieving, who've lost loved ones, those who've had to say goodbye for now. Because we've learned that death is but a sleep. And those who have died in Christ are resting well. You've told us that there's a day coming when the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we, which are alive and remain, will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And so, Lord, in the interim, in this time when we are here on this earth, Father, we ask you to help us to develop and to share with others the character of Christ, understanding that we, too, are witnesses of your hope, your mercy, and your grace to others. Father, allow us to have uh, the presence of peace for others. Allow us to have the words to share with those who are facing discouragement. Allow us, Lord, to be like you, lifters of heads for those who are downtrodden today. Father, allow us to be tangible hands for you as we continue with our bread ministry here at Sharon and, and our food ministry here and uh, to reach out to those who may be in need. Bless them for their willingness to serve as you've called us to serve. Lord, I thank you for those that go beyond prison walls, our lead elder and those who have gone year after year to comfort those who are incarcerated. Father, I ask you to be today with those whose faith needs strengthening. Lord, you are God who has carried us thus far. And you've not brought us this far to leave us now. And so, Father, we thank you for what you have established. We thank you for being the true Father to all of us. Father, we thank you for our fathers today. Those who, like me, have been learning this job on the job training. But we've done it with you. Because, Lord, if we let you into the center of our lives, you remain to be the center of our joy. Thank you, Lord, for loving us and keeping us. Be with us today. Hide me behind the cross. Lord, allow us to open the word and glean what you have for us so that we can share with so many others in celebrating this day of memorial because that's what the Sabbath is. It is a memorial. It's a reminder of the creator of which you are. And so, Lord, we see your creation all around us, and we thank you for that, and we love you. Bless us now and keep us in your holy name we pray. Amen. What a God we serve. And Certainly the next thing after worship and prayers is service. And that's what we do. We come to give back. And I want to say thank you to so many of you, our new friends who've joined us and, and realized that they just want to give back. We thank you for giving back. We thank you for your free will offerings. We thank you for tithing and understanding tithing. Tithing is a form of worship. And those who have learned that worship you, Lord, I uh, have worshiped you in every aspect of their lives. And so we thank you for that. We thank you, Lord, because you have given first. You have given first. And we find that out in John 3, 16, you gave your son. And there are four, four specific ways to give here at Sharon. We've seen it. And actually, there's many, but uh, you can mail it in. You can phone it in online service. We'd love to have you be in the sanctuary today as we normally would do. And we're praying that a day is coming real soon when we'll be able to do that again. But until that time, we have our text giving uh, by simply texting to Sharon SDA 77977. Text Sharon SDA to that number and give freely. It's set up so that you can give freely anytime, anywhere uh, that you would like. Then I want to remind you that uh, we even have our deacons that are here on Sabbath. For those that drive by, and I've seen the cars come and drop by and drop off your offering, your tithe, and we thank you again for that. Uh, between 12 and 2 on Sabbath uh, that we do that. And so you're able to give freely as the Lord has given to you. And so we thank you so much for it. I'm happy today once again to have our music, uh, musicians, 
that are with us. Our musician, our main musician, is Brother Richard Mosley, who blesses our heart every time he sits down at the keyboard. And we ask you, Richard, if you would bless us this morning as we continue to worship him in spirit and in truth. God bless you.
let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience 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 let us become more aware of your presence let us experience the glory of your goodness your presence Lord your presence Without a doubt, we know that we have been revived yes. when we shall leave this place. <laughs> That's all right. Sweet heavenly spirit. Oh. That we have been revived yeah, when we shall leave this place. Oh, mm -mm, when we. Right there. 
Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Thank you, Richard. That's beautiful. I love that song. Sweet Holy Spirit, sweet heavenly dove. Stay right here with us, Lord. Wherever you are, we want him to be right here with us. We want to be in his presence on this day. We want to be in his presence. I dare you. I dare you. Something begins to happen when you allow the presence of the Holy Spirit to rest. To rest upon you. To rest upon the place wherever you are. That's what he most desires to do. He desires to be with you. Thank you so very much. Our scripture reading this morning takes us to Dr. Luke. In Luke chapter 8, the Gospels. There's Matthew, Mark, and there's Luke. Go with me to Luke chapter 8. And we'll begin at verse 40. Luke chapter 8, beginning at verse 40. And in my Bible it says this, And it came to pass that when Jesus was returned, the people gladly received him. For they were all waiting for him. Oh, you can just stop right there. I don't know about you, but I am waiting to see him. In verse 41 of chapter 8 of Luke, And behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue, and he fell down at the feet of Jesus, and at Jesus' feet, and he besought him that he would come into his house. For he had one only daughter, about 12 years of age. And she lay a dying, is what the word says. But as he went, the people thronged him. So much so, he could not move. Verse 43 says, a woman having an issue of blood, 12 years which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any. Does your Bible say something like that? Look at verse 44 of chapter 8 of Luke. She came behind him and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her issue of blood staunched. Verse 45, Jesus said, who touched me? When all denied, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude throng thee and press thee and and saith thou who touched me? How would you know with all of these people pressing you, Jesus? They have been waiting to see you, glad to see you, ready to surround you. And yet in the midst of that, you could tell somebody had touch you? Verse 46, and I love it when the words go red because Jesus is speaking. Jesus said, somebody hath touched me for I perceive that virtue is gone out of me. And when the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling and falling down before him and she declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. Father in heaven, we thank you for being a healing God. We thank you, Lord, that just one touch of the Master as healing properties, just one touch. And so, Lord, we come today 
Not only is the crowd that were waiting to see you, that was anxious to see you, that was glad to see you, we come as a father who is desperate for your healing touch. We come as a father that immediately, not worried about the crowd, but begins to fall immediately at the feet of the master. And so that's what we do this morning, Lord. We bring all of our worries, all of our concerns, all of our issues to the foot of Jesus today. And Father, you do things in your time. We know you have the ability to immediately, but, but sometimes the answer is wait. We've learned that it may be delayed, but it's not denied. And so, Lord, today be with us as we study more. Bless us now and as we move forward. We ask this prayer in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Uh, Luke is, Luke is uh, a doctor, and, and if you look at his writings, when you think of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Luke is, is, is almost writing as though he's always in a hurry. And, uh, a lot of his, a lot of his uh, beginnings is, and this happened, and, and that happened, and he's telling the story of what's going on. However, in Mark uh, chapter 5, who records the same event that we see in Luke chapter 8, and it's... It's recorded uh, by the three synoptic writers. There is a, a story here that, that goes beyond the lady. Her story has been told many times, and uh, some have even said that she had intentionally uh, believed that she could run, get a touch, and keep going. And as the scripture shows, she did come and touch the hem of his garment, and, and, but she found out when Jesus discovered that somebody had touched him, she found out that she was exposed. In verse 47, it says, And when the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him. She fell down before him, and, and at the same time, Jairus' father was on his knees. And I wonder how many others were there kneeling before Jesus, waiting for him. I, I look for a sermon title today because I know some of you need, we have to catalog them some way. I just simply called the title today that Father Knows Best. Father Knows Best. And I struggled with that a little bit because I even told my elder, I said, well, maybe I should say sometimes fathers know best, speaking of earthly fathers. Oh, but we, the reality is that, that the Father, our Father, always, always knows best. And so after we get beyond the lady who had the issue of blood for 12 years, is what verse 43 of Chapter 8 of Luke says, and my Bible says, a woman having an issue of blood 12 years, which she had spent all her living upon physicians, and neither could be healed of any of them. I wondered how Dr. Luke thought about that. <laughs> I, I wonder if Dr. Luke didn't, didn't elaborate on it because he himself was a doctor and, and, and knew that she had went to all these different doctors, and yet she had not been healed. And it's amazing to me that at the same time of this woman who had been dealing with this issue for 12 years, don't, you don't want to miss this, that Jairus, uh, 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 Jairus' uh, uh, father, uh, 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 Jairus uh, uh, who came, a man named Jairus who came for his daughter, his daughter was 12 years also. Something about that number there, uh, 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 something powerful about that number. And, and, and it began in verse 40 that when Jesus came and they all greeted him, verse 41 says that a man named Jairus uh, uh, came and fell at the feet of Jesus. And it described who he was. It said that he was a ruler of the synagogue. So quite possibly he was a priest or, or a pastor or, or he was a, a caretaker of God's property. And he came to Jesus pleading as a father on behalf of the life of his child. I would say that Jairus was a great father. Uh, men regard 
the world uh, as great uh, uh, some fathers of people who are kings, kings who have kept the peace or conquered. Uh, these are men that are dis described as being great or quite possibly a general, a great leader. We've heard of these generals lately uh, in battle. They, they're described as being great. Athletes, uh, when we see some of them that they play at such a level, well, we describe them as being great. Uh, but the view from above uh, and determining greatness is, is men who have come to faith in Christ. That's where greatness comes from. Men who have been faithful to their wives and uh, men who have been examples to their children, uh, those men, in the view from above, are considered great. And Jairus did the greatest thing that a father could do in verse 41. Uh, Jairus, not worried about himself, Jairus, not concerned about himself, was worried about his child, and he came and pleaded at the one who could change things, the, the one who could do for him what nobody else could do. Jairus, in verse 41 of chapter 8, and behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue, and he fell down at Jesus' feet, and he besought him that he would come into his house. There is a belief that when Jesus is in the home, it's, it's a happy, happy home. When Jesus is involved, change is going to happen. Have you invited Jesus into your house? Jairus, a, a, a leader, a, 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 a somewhat different than some of the other Jewish leaders who, who were not as welcoming to this, this Messiah, this Christ. But Jairus knew and had heard him and had saw that Jesus had done this healing all along, in chapter 8, he had already healed a, a, a man, a broken man. He had, he had calmed the sea. He had taken demons out of a demoniac and cast them into the sea. And now, even as Jairus is asking him to come and heal his daughter, whom my Bible said that she was dying in verse 42. For he had only one daughter, about 12 years of age, and she lay a dying. But Jesus, as he proceeded to go, uh, I imagine from the time that, that Jesus heard the plea from Jairus and it began to go, something was happening at that house already. But even as he began to go, the crowd who had been there at the beginning of verse 40 had said that they had been waiting for him, glad to receive him. Are you waiting for him? Are you glad to receive Jesus? It said they had been waiting for him and they had been anxious for him to come. And, and so uh, uh, Jesus' movements were not as free. And that's why even when the woman touched the hem of his garment, uh, they knew that, that, that Jesus couldn't move freely. And, and the disciples and those around him were saying, how can you tell if somebody touches you? Everybody's touching you. Everybody's trying to get close to you. Everybody is anxiously waiting for you who knows about you. But even in the midst of all who are crying out for the Lord, he is so intimate with us that he knows your call. He knows your cry. Even with everybody touching him, he still knew somebody touched me. Oh, that's a God right there. I've always wondered, how is he able to hear all these prayers and, 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 and new prayers? Now, you know there's been a lot of new prayers during the pandemic, folk that ain't prayed in a long time. There are some people that won't get on their knees until crises come. And I've told you, crises bring people to the Lord. And in the midst of a crisis and realizing that nobody else can handle it but God, and, and they come and pray, and I wonder how is he able to hear and respond to all of this fodder of pleas. And yet, even in the crowd, he knew somebody had touched him. 
Have you touched Jesus before? Have you touched Jesus in your, in your pleas, in your prayers? Have you reached out to him, even in the midst of a crowd, even in the midst of everybody else talking, have you brought your plea to the Father? Have you ever touched Jesus to the point where he knows that you've touched him? Jesus is on a mission now because Jairus has asked him to come to his house. And as Jesus begins to move to the house and the crowd is around him, look at verse 48. Uh, look at verse 47. And when the woman, we saw that she hid and she was healed. But look at verse 48. And he said unto her, daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith have made thee whole. That's why faith is so important, everybody. It is her faith that did it. He said, now go, go, go in peace. He said, go, because he's on a mission. While he yet spake, verse 49, there cometh one from the ruler of the synagogue's house saying to him, thy daughter is dead. Trouble not the master. Call him off. I know you pleaded, Jairus. I know you were on your knees, but it is a failed cause for man. She's gone. But when Jesus heard it, look at verse 50. And he answered him saying, fear not. Believe only and she shall be made whole. Now, you can imagine that those around him are listening and they want to see how is he going to do this. They've seen what he's been able to do. Uh, this woman uh, who had the, the issue of blood, she had been cut off because of her issue of blood. In fact, Leviticus chapter 15 says that because of her blood flow, she was not able to be around people. And that's why she snuck in to touch the hem of his garment. And then now that as Jesus is beginning to go and do the mission that Jairus had fallen on his knees to ask him to do. And, and, and now there is one who's come and said, you don't need to come, Jesus. She's dead. Jesus shows who he is in verse 50. And let's look at verse 51 of chapter 8 of Luke. And when he came into the house, he suffered no man to go in, except Peter and James and John and the father and the mother of the maiden. All wept and bewailed her, but he said, weep not, she's not dead. But sleepeth, those who have followed us and understanding those five S's of, of our study, of our faith, uh, we've hit just about many of them. There, there are five S's. You don't want to forget these. Uh, the five S's are like this. Uh, we have a different understanding of the state of the dead. And I've preached on that, and I've preached what the Bible says about the dead. And Jesus is validating here. We've learned that the death is but a sleep. That's what death is. So those who are grieving today for their loved ones, if they've died in Jesus, they're simply asleep. It is not the end of the story. It is, it is but a pause. Some people say a comma. It is not but just a simple pause because the Bible says that the dead in Christ will rise first. Jesus is validating that. He said, weep not. She's not dead. Even though they've come to him and, and quite possibly uh, uh, with, with, the, the, with the truth of what they saw. But Jesus says she's asleep. And so the state of the dead, another one that we deal with, we've dealt with uh, uh, the spirit of prophecy. Remember, we talked about prophecy and how 40% uh, of the Bible deals with prophecy. God, Jesus was always talking about things that must come to pass. That's prophecy. There is a spirit of prophecy. That's that's the second one. So the state of the dead, the spirit of prophecy. And then there's a study which is so powerful of the sanctuary. You want to know where Jesus is today? He is in the sanctuary, not, not the sanctuary made with man's hands, but the heavenly sanctuary. You need to study that. Uh, we took a study of that when we did our, our, our Daniel and Revelation experience, and we talked about the sanctuary, and, and it is an understanding that we as God's remnant church have. So the state of the dead, we've got an understanding, of it, not because of our own, but because of the word of God. The Bible interprets itself. We understand the spirit of prophecy, what God has told us, these things must shortly come to pass. And then understanding the sanctuary allows you to know what Jesus is doing now. That's why we pray in the name of Jesus, because he's interceding on our behalf. That's what he does. That's why we pray, and that's why we keep him 
uplifted and encouraged. That's why we know uh, who he is. That's why we continue to watch and continue to wait for our Savior to come. And then, then, there's, uh, then there's a four, fourth S, state of the dead, spirit of prophecy, uh, the sanctuary, and then there is the Sabbath, right there in the heart of it. And when you begin to get an understanding of the Sabbath uh, and, and what it truly means, the Sabbath, uh, what the Sabbath is, what the day is, is just a memorial to creation. And the reason that we, as the remnant church of God, come to church on the Sabbath is because God said it. God said, remember it. God said, keep it holy. And the reason that he said this is because he wants you to know that he is the creator. And that's what Sabbath is. A Sabbath is, the, is a memorial to creation. That's what the day is. When I see the trees, when I, when I see the grass, when I see the mountains, and I, I'm reminded that he is the creator. Worship him who made the heaven and the earth, the sea, and all that in the midst. And so the Sabbath becomes the fourth S of our study. There, state of the dead we dealt with. Uh, we certainly ha ha have dealt with the spirit of prophecy. Oh, the sanctuary, knowing where Jesus is, that he's in the most holy place, not on earth, but in heaven. And then we deal with the Sabbath of what today is. And then there's one that we're all looking forward to. And we are so anxiously looking forward to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And just as they in Luke chapter 8, verse 40, it said they were waiting for him. And they received him gladly. Oh, we're waiting for the master. We're waiting for him to come. So Jesus is now going forward with the mission that Jairus, who fell on his knees, this father who could care less what anybody else thinks, this father who came to the one who could do something about his daughter, who the Bible said she was dying, and he asked Jesus to come to his house. Because he knew if Jesus comes to the house, something's going to change. And there are the doubters, there are the ones that will try to stop you. And uh, the one who came to him and said, uh, she's dead. Jairus came because it was his only daughter. That's what the Bible tells me. It was his, his only daughter. In verse 42, it says, for he had one only daughter. You know, if I'm going to go to somebody, I want to go to somebody who relates, somebody who understands. And I know that the father knows about having a single child because he himself had a son, his only son, in whom he loved. So if you're going to plead for somebody to, to help you, you, you need to plead for somebody who understands, who, somebody who, who has a little sympathy, empathy for you. And, and so when Jairus came to Jesus, uh, Jesus being that son, the only son, who God loved, the father loves his son, then Jairus loved his daughter. You know, in some cultures, Oriental cultures have this, when you, when you have one child and that child dies, uh, that means that you lose your, your, your connection, your family line may end there. And that's why Jairus was probably even more anxious to get there, even more anxious to get to this child uh, and bring Jesus to her. Verse 53 says, after he told them that she's just sleeping, uh, it said they all laughed at him to scorn, uh, uh, knowing that she was dead. And, they, and, and he put them all out and took her by the hand and called, saying, Maid, arise. And her spirit came again. Verse 55. You see, Jairus did the greatest thing by uh, even being a Jewish leader, by falling at the feet of Jesus. He came with a troubled heart. Uh, Jairus uh, brought his problems to Jesus, a problem that nobody else could solve. He needed a touch from God on one that he loved. It was the greatest thing that he could do. A father knows best, and in this instance, Jairus knew what to do. Jairus demonstrated the greatest example of a father's love for his child. He came to talk to Jesus about his child. Uh, the most privileged children in the world are those whose parents pray for them. I'm so glad that our conference, and I, I love my colleague in faith, Pastor Patrick Graham and his team, every Monday at 1 o'clock, 
right there on the AEC website, visit AEC.org. If you've not done it, you need to get there. They take requests on the names of children. And I try not to miss a week. I, I even have mine already set that I sent them in. I ask you to pray for my, my sons and my daughter and my, and my uh, daughter-in-law. And I ask you to pray for those. And I ask you to pray for the children of Sharon. I ask you to pray for my nieces and nephews. I ask you to pray for those children that we come in contact with in our conference. And every Monday they go through the list and they pray. One thing we're told to do is to pray for your children by name. The most privileged children in the world are, are those whose names are often before the throne of grace. You want to talk about underprivileged children? The most underprivileged children in the world are those who grow up in godless homes. Those whose parents do not even pray for them. We can pray for our children and expect answers. Uh, there are Bible answers of prayers being answered. Noah prayed and Abraham prayed and, and Job prayed and Joshua prayed. And there are things that happen when you begin to pray. A father who will take care of his children is a great man. And that's an earthly father who knows best. Uh, Jairus faced the, the greatest test of a father's faith. Uh, when he awaits news of his child's welfare. Even though Jesus had called them in, when the news came, it was bad news and said she was dead. Uh, the encouragement from Jesus at this dark development, when he said, fear not, believe only, and she shall be made whole. Nothing takes Jesus by surprise. Even those coming when everything looks dark. Jesus had prepared Jairus for this moment. He prepared him by the healing of the woman. Jairus was there. Jairus had fallen to his knees when the woman with the issue of blood of 12 years fell to her knees. Jairus had seen it. Jairus had to be close to Jesus. He, he was walking with Jesus, and we encounter faith builders when we see what Jesus has done for others. The daughter of this great father was healed, and she was healed by our Savior. Nothing is beyond his power. He said, fear not and believe. Fear not. And he says to you today, when we speak of fathers, and the word fathers, and we're told even in the word of God, to honor our fathers and our mothers. But I was thinking, and at first, and I shared that I really wanted to speak on the difference today between a father and a dad. Many people have different names for their fathers, and, uh, but when you hear the term dad, there is a difference. Uh, being a father is one who requires little emotional involvement, to be honest with you. Uh, the other is a long lifetime commitment when you're a dad. Uh, you don't hear uh, the analysis of the dad, but you you hear Sigmund Freud and these others talk about fathers. One is an entity and the other, the other is an emotion. There's a difference between being a father and being a dad. And let me say today, if your father is resting, waiting on the Lord, God bless you. Because we serve the true father who knows best. And he comforts you. But every er earthly fathers ever known the difference between the, uh, having a, a shirt that you truly love and a uniform or suit that you have to wear? That's the difference between a father and a dad. A dad is that shirt that you love to wear. A dad is that reminder. Dads are always present, even though fathers are not. Dads are holistically responsible for the well-being of their children. In fact, in the spirit of prophecy, you'll find out that the burden is really on the father to nurture the children. We'll teach you that. Uh, there are supports in uh, all aspects of our lives that dads give in the economical and paying the bills and taking care of the justified wants of their children. That's what dads do. Uh, a child's mind is like a blank slate. It needs the right amount of stimuli, the right kind of stimuli in a manner that makes the stimuli comprehensible. Dads are experts in doing this. 
Dads are the ones that put you on their knee and let you drive a car when the mom is going crazy. <laughs> Dads are the ones, and you've seen some that do things, and you just say, help us, Jesus. Uh, throwing the children up in the air and throw them up so high, you wonder if everything's going to be all right. But a dad is right there to catch him. Dads are the emotional, the bad rock, and, and, and whether you knew this or not, uh, not only in the life of a young boy, dads are the most influential in the lives of young girls. Yes, we love our mothers. God bless you. And, and God bless those mothers who've had to fulfill the role of mother and father. But there is a difference between a father and a dad. Dads are responsible for making great citizens uh, out of our children. Uh, they also use meaningful ways of disciplining the children. Uh, father will make sure that that discipline always happens. Uh, a dad sometimes will even forget and even tell the child that he's let it go. And fathers may not always be there, but dads are there. Dads make an effort to be better understanding of their children. Uh, they listen to their children not just hear them as a father does. The fathers sometimes make no effort to bridge the gap between themselves and their children. Uh, they are sometimes lackadaisical, and, and in consequence, their children end up lacking the life skills. In the worst of cases, they become problematic. But dads, dads turn out to be the superheroes for their children, not because they're perfect, but because they have flaws. Most dads are the loving dads because the children see their flaws. Uh, some fathers are perfectly suited for their role. But it's a little bit different when you're a dad. Dads take the situation and make it better in many instances. Fathers, God bless them sometimes, are judgmental. Dads are understanding. And I think the difference is that a dad remembers. Dads remember that they made mistakes. And there are not too many dads out there that haven't made mistakes raising their children. Don't, don't beat yourself up. <laughs> it's been on the job training. But the difference between a mere formal father and being a dad. You can see it in the Bible. In the Old Testament, we have God the Father. God love him. And we see the law is very pronounced. We see the law is very prevalent. We see the firm hand of God in the Old Testament. But then comes the New Testament. The one where God loves us so much that he sends a baby. And Jesus comes and Jesus represents the dad. The compassion, the love, the forgiveness, the mercy. Not too much of a difference between God the Father and Jesus because they are one, but their roles, their roles can show us the difference. In the New Testament, thanks to the love of Jesus Christ, God becomes more familiar, familiar to us as a dad with his mercy and his love personifying. I don't know what your dad was like. I don't know if he was a good man or his flaws were such that it was insurmountable to some. But no matter what, you still have the obligation of what the Bible says. And one of the very first promises to man, honor your father and your mother. And it goes on to say that your days may be long. God gave us this because father the Father knows best. 
And so on this Sabbath, as we prepare to celebrate it, we ask you those whose fathers are not with us anymore. We ask you as men to step up and be a father to some young child. To demonstrate the love for that child as God has demonstrated to you. We are adopted into the family. Take some child and demonstrate fatherly compassion and fatherly love in the form of being a dad. Even with flaws and all, and you can still demonstrate to them because you become a great father when you have come to the faith in Christ. You become a great father when you're faithful to your word. You become a great dad when you do those things that take care of your children. And you become an example of what God has called for us to do. And so today we pray for our, our fathers, and we pray for those who are simply bad. God bless you to those who have just begun the journey. We ask for sustaining abilities for those who have been on the road for quite a while. You will always be connected for the rest of your life with the children that you brought into this world. And the way that you'll be able to handle it is by understanding the Father, and what He requires of us, and what He gives us, because that Father does know best, and if we're following Him, then we too can be great dads for our children. Let's pray, everybody. Father in heaven, I thank you for yet another Sabbath. I thank you for a season of recognizing Father, I ask you to be with those who are struggling as fathers, who may not have all of the resources, yet they're still striving hard to be good dads. I ask you to come alongside those that don't know quite how to handle the role because maybe their dad was not there for them, their father wasn't there for them. But Father, you know best and you are able to give them everything they need. Father, help them so they don't oversteer and become too stern or become so lackadaisical that they are ineffective. Uh, Father, help them to understand what it means to be like you. And so today, that's our prayer. We ask for the joy of families that come together tomorrow virtually or however they can we ask for children to call their dads who haven't called them in a long while. We ask for fathers to call their children. We ask for those who will come together, will ask the father who knows best to be a part of their lives. And if he's a part of your life, he will be the center of your joy. That's our prayer, Lord. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. God bless you.
Help me. 